This is the 11th episode in the P3 revision tutorials. Today we will be looking at cyclotrons as well as circular motion. We will be looking at centripetal force in particular. In this video we will look at how particle accelerators help scientists understand the physical world. We will look at why circular motion results in centripetal force as well as what centripetal force is. And finally we will look at the use of particle accelerators to produce radioactive isotopes within medicine. Whenever we are thinking about cyclotrons we must also think of the Large Hadron Collider which can be seen here. The Large Hadron Collider is the world's biggest cyclotron and accelerates protons in order to look at the origins of the universe. This works by accelerating the protons and then firing them in opposite directions around the Large Hadron Collider in order for them to accelerate. The CERN lab at Geneva is a huge particle accelerator which is 27 kilometres in circumference. So large in fact that it spreads across the French-Swiss border with detectors on both sides. The most major discovery so far at CERN has been the exact presence of the Higgs boson. This was a particle that we looked at in a previous tutorial, which was theorised for many years before finally being detected. CERN are now starting to look at supersymmetrical particles, or SUSY for short. So our big question has to be, how does it work? Well, the particles need to be accelerated in order to carry out experiments including proton enrichment as well as investigating the universe. Proton enrichment is when we bombard a nucleus with protons in order to change it into an alternate element. So in order to look at this, we first need to look at circular motion in regards to how we can accelerate a particle. So for any object to travel in a circle, there has to be a centripetal force acting on it. This is a force that is pulling the object towards the center of its orbit. So for the Earth traveling around the sun, this will be gravity, which will be the force pulling it inwards towards the sun. As I mentioned, this force pulling it inwards is known as centripetal force. A common mistake is calling it centrifugal force. As we can see here, centrifugal force is in fact when an object is pushed away from the centre. We are interested in centripetal force, which is where the force is acting inwards towards the centre of this circle. So as we saw, our centripetal force is the force acting towards the centre of this circle. This is required due to the circular motion that the particles are travelling in. These particles are constantly accelerating. This is because the velocity is the speed and direction of an object. If you remember back to P1 and P2, velocity is a speed in a particular direction. Therefore, if the velocity is the speed and direction, as the particle travels in a circle, it is constantly changing direction. We can see here that the direction of the velocity is changing. Because it is constantly changing direction, this means it must be accelerating. So we have particles that are constantly accelerating. However, they are not going to speed off into space. Instead, there has to be a resultant force acting upon it. Remember that the resultant forces must be balanced. This resultant force is our centripetal force, which is pulling the object towards the centre of the circle. Therefore, the force that keeps something moving in a circle has to be this centripetal force due to this constant change in acceleration. We will now look at how we can use a magnetic field in order to affect the direction of travel. Due to the charges on both alpha particles and beta minus particles, they will be affected by magnetic fields. 
If you recall, our alpha particle, our helium atom nucleus, has two protons, two neutrons, therefore an overall charge of plus two. So it's going to be a positive charge. However, our beta particle, our high energy electron, is made up of just the solitary electron, therefore giving it a charge of minus one, so an overall negative charge. We are now going to look at what happens when they come into contact with a magnetic field. If we were to say that the red box at the bottom of the page here has a negative charge, whereas the blue box is going to be the area over which the magnetic field is going to take effect, our two particles are going to be affected differently by this area of negative charge. So first of all, our alpha particle. Here is our alpha particle. As our alpha particle is shot into this area of negative charge, it's, it's going to be attracted to this negative charge. And so it is going to deflect towards the negative charge. However, our beta particle, which is here, so if we shoot in our beta particle, it is now going to be repelled by the negative charge. As it is much, much smaller than the alpha particle, it is going to be repelled further, and so it will accelerate. When the charged particles move into a magnetic field, they experience the force. This causes a perpendicular change to its direction of travel, making the particle follow a curved track. The direction of the force on the particle depends on its charge. Therefore, as we saw, the path of a negatively charged and positively charged particle will be different and they will curve in opposite directions. Usually, you will not see a neat circular pattern. Instead, the particles will move in a spiral shape. This is because the particles will lose energy and slow down as they interact with other particles. And the less energy the particles have, the more curved their path will be. By using magnetic fields such as this, we can make charged particles move in a circular or spiral path. This is how we can use them in particle accelerators such as cyclotrons. So here we have our cyclotron. The cyclotron was invented by Ernest Lawrence and it uses electric and magnetic fields to accelerate particles in a circle. The charged particles, for example the protons, will start right in the centre of our cyclotron here. This is where they are released into our cyclotron. And as we can see, the cyclotron is made up of two hollow semicircular electrodes. These are then used to accelerate the protons across this gap. It is this gap here that causes the protons to accelerate. In order to do this, an alternating voltage is applied between the electrodes. This causes the protons to be attracted from one side to the other. This causes them to move across the gap. As they are attracted from one side to the other, this causes their energy to increase and therefore they are accelerated. As we can see on the diagram, we have a magnetic field. This is used to make sure that the particles move in a circular motion. We have a vacuum chamber to prevent interference from outside of the cyclotron. And finally, as we can see, once the protons have been sufficiently accelerated, they then exit the cyclotron as a beam. This can then be fired at the target. In the example of the Large Hadron Collider, the protons are accelerated through multiple cyclotrons until they reach the large ring of the Large Hadron Collider. So, as a conclusion, the cyclotron is just a circular particle accelerator. On the diagram, we have a detailed picture 
of a cyclotron for accelerating electrons. However, the same principles will work for protons, just in reverse. As we can see, as the accelerating electric field reverses, just as the electrons or the protons finish their half circle, this accelerates them across the gap and then they will start to move in a wider circle. This is because at higher speed they will move in a larger semicircle due to the higher energy. After repeating this over and over they will then exit at high speed. As we have now looked at the theory behind protons it is important to understand why we will accelerate protons. We're going to look at one particular use of this called proton enrichment. As I previously mentioned, proton enrichment involves firing protons at a nucleus in order to form a radioactive isotope. The proton will be absorbed into the nucleus, increasing its proton number and hence creating a new element. In order for the proton to be absorbed by the nucleus, we need a high level of energy, and hence, this is where our cyclotron will come in. The radioisotopes made via proton enrichment tend to be positron emitters. If you remember back to the previous video, we looked at positron emitters and what the positron was. But as a reminder, it is the antiparticle of the electron. It is an electron with a positive charge. These are particularly useful in hospitals where we can use them in PET scans as we looked at in the past videos. This is where we can monitor blood flow and metabolism. However, the isotopes that we make have a very short half-life so that the radiation is minimised. Examples of positron emitters include fluorine 18, which is used in PET scans, carbon 11, and nitrogen 13. We will now quickly refresh these decay equations. As mentioned on the previous slide, we will be looking at fluorine 18, carbon 11 and nitrogen 13 to look at how we can make these positron emitters as well as the emission itself. So our first radioisotope was fluorine 18. Fluorine 18 is made using an isotope of oxygen called oxygen 18. We bombard oxygen 18 with a proton, making fluorine 18 and causing the release of one neutron. For our fluorine 18 decay equation, we will have fluorine 18 becoming oxygen 18 with the release of a positron. This radioisotope has a half-life of just under two hours. This makes it suitable for PET scans as it is a very short half-life, however it is long enough in order to be able to carry out the scan. Our next radioisotope is carbon-11. Carbon-11 is made using nitrogen-14 and has a half-life of about 20 minutes. However, this time, instead of releasing our neutron, we release our helium here, our 4,2, which is very similar to our alpha particle. Our final example we will look at is nitrogen-13. Nitrogen-13 is made using oxygen-16, and like carbon-11, it's going to release our helium atom. However, this time it has a half-life of only about 10 minutes. This makes nitrogen-13 completely unviable for use in PET scans as its half-life is too short. So, we now have our three positron emitters, nitrogen-13, carbon-11 and fluorine-18, all of which, which could be used in PET scans, However, as I mentioned, nitrogen 13's incredibly short half-life makes it almost unviable. Carbon 11 is slightly better. However, fluorine 18 is the preferred radioisotope. This is also because fluorine 18 can be added to a radioactive isotope of glucose, which will be taken up by the brain, allowing a PET scan to examine brain activity. 
However, particle accelerators aren't just used for medical purposes. As we looked at previously, they can also be used in order for scientists to find out about the universe. So we can also use particle accelerators to study the universe, for example, the work that has been done at CERN. As we have mentioned previously, CERN found the discovery of the Higgs boson and is currently looking into supersymmetry. This is done by smashing particles into each other at very high speed and energy. Scientists can then look at the particles that have been created during this impact in order to look at the physical world as well as looking at the creation of the universe. This is done by recreating the conditions just after the Big Bang, looking at colliding beams of protons head on at incredibly fast speeds. We are now starting to look at a phenomenon known as supersymmetry as well as dark matter and dark energy. In the next video, we will look at collisions in more detail, including what happens during the annihilation of positrons and electrons, as well as how mass is conserved.